So let's just start with some etymology. I like my etymology. Who knows what entrepreneur, what the etymology of the word entrepreneur is? Entrepreneur. French people. Entrepreneur. It means literally to undertake. An entrepreneur is an undertaker. The first person to come up with this idea was, uh, uh, was a Frenchman named Richard Cantillon. Uh, wrote a book in French, uh, and he introduced this word as entrepreneur. And in the first translation of this book, it was translated as undertaker. Uh, but we already have an English word of undertaker, and it doesn't mean what we typically think of when we say entrepreneur. Uh, so we kept the French word. But entrepreneurs, what do they undertake? What are they undertaking? That's going to be the question we'll try to answer for this lesson. But let's start with this question. Should somebody who works at Starbucks make enough money to buy what they make at Starbucks? Who says yes? Who says no? OK, several hands went up for yes. Not many or any hands went up for no. Uh, should someone who works at a Ford plant make enough money to buy what they make at Ford plants, which is Ford automobiles? Who says yes? Who says no? Okay, one hand went up for no this time. What about someone who works for Ferrari? Should someone who works at Ferrari make enough money to buy a Ferrari? Who says yes? One hand says yes. Who says no? More hands saying no. Those of you who had your hand up for no, uh, uh, but you had your hand up for yes for the other questions. Why no for Ferrari workers? Why shouldn't Ferrari workers get paid enough to buy a Ferrari, but Ford workers should be paid enough to get a Ferrari? You all had opinions. Who wants to share their opinion? Do you in the back want to say why a Ferrari worker should uh, make enough money to buy a Ferrari? Because I was working to buy a Ferrari and wanted to get enough money to get a Ferrari. That's just my question. Yeah. Anybody have? Yeah, in the back. Isn't Interesting points. They're doing the same kind of work at Ford and Ferrari, so why should they be paid more? Yes? Wouldn't it be harder to sell a Ferrari? Wouldn't it be hard to sell a Ferrari? Less uh, people interested. Why would that be? Selective audience, not enough people have uh, not as much of enough money to buy a Ferrari. True, not enough people have enough money to buy a Ferrari. Uh, in the back. Show the exclusivity, but we can say it's exclusive to everyone who works at Ferrari plus the other people. Any other ideas? Yes? The pay factor into the commission? Yeah. Is pay into the commission factored into pay? Um, let's just focus on uh, the people who actually make the cars. So they don't make commission. The commission question is interesting. Yeah. Wouldn't it depend on their value to their company? That's an interesting way of putting it. But the question is still, should someone who works at Ferrari make enough money to buy a Ferrari? How does that relate to the value that they provide to the company? There are so many different people, so many different jobs that go into making one car. If you're an engineer, you decide the newest, fastest engine that's making the Ferrari billion is like four dollars. That's a great point. 
There are all sorts of different people who work at Ferrari. Ferrari has engineers. Ferrari has marketers. Ferrari even has a janitor. But they probably have many janitors. But uh, should they all be paid enough to buy a Ferrari? Should a janitor at Ferrari be paid enough to buy a Ferrari? Yeah? What is the time scale? Are you talking about paid enough in a day, paid enough in a lifetime, in a month? That's another great question. What is the time scale? Is it, should you be able to buy a new Ferrari per shift? Or per year? Or per 10 years? Yeah. Forget even the discounts. Forget even the discounts. Like, do you think the costs of making a Ferrari are the same as the costs of making a Ford? Let's talk about typical Ford right now. Do they sound like Tauruses? Uh, what's the focus? Ford focused. That's the big one. Does it cost about the same to make a Ford Focus as it does to make a Ferrari La Ferrari, which is the highest end Ferrari? Why do they sell for different prices? Why does a Ferrari sell for a different price than a Ford? Let's just focus on scarcity as, as an objective, as a criteria for why something is expensive. I'm going to write my name here and this symbol. How many other pieces of paper do you think say that? A lot or a little? Do you think there are more pieces of paper that have my little signature here or more Ferrari La Ferraris? There are more Ferraris. So which is more scarce? Ferraris? Ferraris are more scarce? But there's only one of these. That's more rare. The Ferraris are scarce. Ah. What's the distinction between rarity and scarcity <laughs> in, your, in your terminology? Um, scarcity is like a measure of value. Scarcity is a measure of value. So like, and then what's rarity? Rarity is like the amount of things in existence. So like the <laughs> Who's got a, that's, that's fair enough. Who's got an easier way of uh, phrasing that? Yeah. Oh, not that. Just the original point, is just, Ferraris are a luxury item. Ferraris are, why can't this be a luxury item? <laughs> well, like, I, I think a Ford can be from A to B, yeah. but a Ferrari can do that in much, a bunch of frills as well. You think, which, which, which one do you think actually has more frills? A Ford or a Ferrari? I'll tell you right now, a Ford probably has a lot more frills, a lot more excess stuff than a Ferrari. Has a lot more fancy electronics and actually electronics that work. Probably Ford will last longer, etc. Yeah, Jando. Never mind. Let's try calling out someone else. Behind, yeah, no, you in the black. So the man, yes? Um, anyone can make that piece of paper, but not anyone can make a Ferrari. No one can, no one can sign this piece of paper like I <laughs> Prices are set by supply and demand. You cannot talk about a price by the only focusing on just one side of that equation. Most of the time when people talk about scarcity, they mean there's just not a lot of supply. But it's not a lot of supply compared to a lot of demand. 
there's zero demand for that piece of paper. So it doesn't matter if I have one of these or a million. It's always, there's never going to be a scarcity of these because there's, the demand is zero. But Ferraris, every single one of you here would be happy to get a Ferrari. Let's talk about, let's bring this back to the entrepreneur. The entrepreneur, what are they trying to do? So I, I've mentioned before in this class that the entrepreneur's job is to predict the future. But AI also predicts the future. Machine learning, if you've heard that word thrown around, also predicts the future. Is AI entrepreneurship? predicting what people will want, and then also providing for that want. Predicting isn't an easy business. Let's take up a, this table. Capital of Canada, everybody knows this. It's a known known. It's not a mystery. There are also known unknowns. There are things that you know, but you don't know that you know. Things that you know, but you don't know that you know. Who knows how to ride a bike? Who knows how to ride a bike? How do you, when you're riding a bike, how do you keep balance? Um, basically trying to keep like, the center of gravity like, near the seat. Like. Shh, quiet, please. Saying how? You're okay. trying to keep your center of gravity? Like on the seat, so like, you're stable and you don't like, have to like, lean to either side. I wish I brought my bike. <laughs> when you're riding a bike, are you shifting your butt around like this? Is this how you ride a bike? Is that how you ride a bike? No? How do people actually ride a bike? It's, you're swerving with your hands using the tires, right? Using the wheels. So you knew how to ride a bike, but you didn't know how you ride a bike. Fair enough? you don't know that you actually know. There's some things you don't know that you actually know. What could be an example of something you don't know but you actually know? Sometimes, you know, you surprise, your, your own strength surprises you. You get mad at someone and you scream at them and you're like, oh, I don't know where that came from. Right? You have siblings, maybe you got in a fight with your sibling once. You hit them hard and then they start crying and you're like, ah, didn't mean to make you cry. Don't tell mom. Right? Call your own strength as an example. Finally, there are unknown unknowns. What could be an unknown unknown? What could be an unknown unknown? I 
An unknown unknown. Yeah. Don't you feel like the afterlife, like nobody has any idea what happened? But, but you think that you know that there is an afterlife. But so that would actually be like a sort of known unknown. Okay. Right? Yeah. Yeah, that's about it. Is. An unknown unknown is something that you don't even know that you don't know. You don't even know that that, that knowledge even exists. Before you started this course, how many of you have never even heard of a supply and demand graph? And now you all know. That was an unknown unknown. Entrepreneurs also deal with known unknowns as well as unknown unknowns. An entrepreneur, Steve Jobs, when he first started making uh, the iPhone, he knew that uh, there was a demand for smartphones. There was a demand for a phone that had access to the internet. But there was zero other precedence for a phone that had uh, a touch screen. All phones at that time had these physical keyboards, the famous Blackberry being the most uh, common example. And then he went to some banks and went to uh, uh, other phone carriers and said, hey, what if I make just a phone that's only touch screen? People were suspicious. It was a known unknown. He had the technology. Actually, the story is he didn't even have the phone yet. He, was, he initially started making the tablet first. He started making the iPad first, and he said, what if we just make the iPad smaller to make it a phone? Can we throw in a GSM device into this phone, into this tablet, and make it smaller? Would that work? What was an unknown unknown when Steve Jobs first made the, uh, the iPhone was that Snapchat was ever going to come and be a thing. Who knew that when the first touchscreen came out, a temporary photo sharing uh, app would develop that teens would use it for nefarious purposes at first. You all know what I'm talking about. And then start doing uh, university group assignments via it as well. That was, that was crazy. You guys started texting me or emailing me. Oh, our group chat, our, our Know, our group Snapchat for a university for the steering project. I was like, you guys are using Snapchat for the university now? That's one. So entrepreneurs take on known unknowns as well as unknown unknowns. How do they know whether they've been successful? So they're risking things, right? So they're they're, they borrow money, they make things, they bring them to market, they don't know if it's going to sell. And then let's say they do make some sales. How do they decide whether to continue uh, with selling things or not? Yeah? What do we call it when your revenue is greater than your cost? Profit. Economic profit has a special symbol. Sometimes they just write profit. Usually it's a capital pi. Capital pi is total revenue minus total cost. Total revenue minus total cost. Total revenue includes not only that the money you make, but also the emotional benefits that you make. But it's hard to calculate your emotional benefits, so entrepreneurs typically just focus on the money benefits. Total cost is your money cost plus your emotional cost, plus your opportunity cost, all these other things. Those things are hard to measure, so we just focus on the money cost. If your total money revenue is greater than your total money cost, 
Are you making an economic profit? Silence in the room. I'm guessing it's because you know the correct answer is unknown. It's uncertain. It's because economic profit is not the same as accounting profit. Accounting profit is only money costs and money revenues. Accounting profit is if your money revenues are greater than your money costs, then you've made an accounting profit. Accounting profit is not the same as economic profit. Economic profit has to take account your subjective benefits and your subjective costs as well. You could be making an accounting profit, but you could be making an economic loss. Yes? We'll get to non for profits in a second. When a business is calculating their economic profit, they have to take into account all their costs and all their benefits. For example, Bill Gates can spend the rest of his life buying and selling crap from yard sales. He could even make an accounting profit buying and selling crap from yard sales. Would that be an economic profit for Bill Gates? Probably not. He could make a much larger profit focusing on his non-profit charity, etc. His dealings with Microsoft, etc. Other than non-profits, any other questions so far? Let's talk about nonprofits. When someone is a nonprofit, what kind of profit are they not making? Okay, let's just legally, a nonprofit, who knows what a legally, legally what a nonprofit is? Legally, a nonprofit, so you have, when you have a corporation, when you set up a corporation, and the corporation makes profit, uh, a for-profit corporation can take those profits and pay them as dividends to the shareholders. Okay? For-profit corporations pay dividends to their shareholders. Not-for-profit corporations are legally not allowed to pay dividends to shareholders. That's why they're not called shareholders, they're called members. You guys know uh, Mountain Equipment Co-op? They are not profit not-for-profit corporation, you're a member, you pay five bucks. As a member, you don't get a share of the revenues. It's illegal for them to pay you as a share of the revenues. On this topic, just a slight uh, distinction between a not-for-profit corporation and a charity. Charities in Canada are not-for-profits that also are tax-exempt. To become tax-exempt, charity in Canada, it's a very expensive, uh, uh, costly, time-consuming process. Uh, it takes a couple hundred thousand dollars and maybe a year to, uh, to get through. And once you become a registered charity, you actually have to disclose all your uh, financial revenues and costs publicly. There's, a there's an online service where you can just type in the name of any re Canadian registered charity and it'll show you where they made their money, where they spent their money. Yes? The benefits are, do you think monetary or economic? They're gonna be economic. They're gonna be, by economic I mean that broadly construed, right? They're gonna be subjective. So Costco is a strange situation, but like uh, uh, a co-op, like a farmer's market co-op sort of thing. You pay in five bucks and then they'll say, if you're a member, you can come in and uh, use our, buy from our vendors. Or you've got these other uh, think tanks, typically. They're not-for-profits. You donate some money to them so that they're putting up uh, reports that you like to read and they're engaging in uh, social media activities that you don't have time to engage in, etc. Yes? Through a Yeah, you can give discounts and stuff. You just can't pay them a dividend.
Yes. Will then and the owners ever go off to make money off of it later? Or? No. So the, the owners are not going to go off. So yeah. They can't make a. They can't draw any uh, dividends. That's different from making money. You can draw salaries. You can pay people salaries, but you can't pay them dividends, which is just a cash payout straight from your accounting profits. Yes. So are like total costs supposed to equal total revenues? Yeah. Like exactly. If there is a business that's making an economic profit. How long can that business, well, what, what, would, you, what would you think, so let's say there's, uh, uh, what's an example, like Amazon or Apple. Apple's making a lot of money in accounting terms. Do you think they're making a lot of money in economic terms? Or Ferrari? Probably. The, the way you know someone is making an economic profit is that they're continuing to do a thing. Someone's continuing to do something, subjectively they're expecting to make an economic profit. So you see Ferrari making all this profit, or Apple making all this profit. If you're another businessman, what are you going to do? Are you just going to let them have all those profits? No. You're going to try to get a taste. You try to get a cut into those profits. So you see them making profits, and for businesses, the easiest uh, rule of thumb is to look at their accounting profits, but it's not always easy to do. Because we know for a fact, uh, or as it's part of our myth, and now it's, it's, uh, it's part of in the West, that Amazon for decades was making no profit, right? It was making no accounting profit. Why would people keep dumping in money into Amazon? It's because they still expected a lot of economic profit. And accounting is very tricky. What counts as a cost in accounting is sometimes just an arbitrary rule. There are tax exemptions you can take care of, you can take advantage of in order to minimize your profit for tax reasons, but you're still making economic profit. Everybody knows Amazon doesn't pay any taxes, or they pay very little taxes. It's because their accounting profit, as per the tax revenue code, is very, very small. It's very, very small. It's because they're reinvesting their revenues with, into the company for growth and that doesn't count as taking out dividends or paying out dividends. It doesn't count as profit. Get your hand up. Um, yeah, like what are some examples of like an economic profit that aren't taking money? Yes. Like, so, like, is that just like happiness? Like, is that yeah, it's happiness. It's just, it's just your own sense of satisfaction. It's when somebody quits a high paying job to start a bed and breakfast out in the middle of nowhere, basically making no money, maybe even making a loss. Right? A lot of restaurants um, or small coffee shops, they're run by just a retired person. It's just a way of them keeping themselves busy. They're losing money. They're losing, they're money losing enterprises. But they're kept in business because the guy likes making, likes making coffee for himself and for his friends. But most businesses are in the business of making an accounting profit. And the great equalizer of subjective preferences is money. Because money is the most universally wanted thing in a society. Yeah? So you're like a non-profit like organization, is that they're just not making an accounting profit? They're still... A non-profit organization can still be making an accounting profit, but they're just not allowed to take out dividends. They're not allowed to pay dividends. They're not allowed to, they have their profits. They can't say, okay, we had a lot of profits this year. Let's uh, take a vacation. They have to reinvest those profits into the company side. They can't pay those out to shareholders. Any other questions?
What does it mean to own a company? It means to own a portion of those, um, of the profits or losses, okay? We haven't talked about losses. It's totally possible to earn economic losses. Even though you're earning accounting profits, you could be earning economic losses. That was the example with Bill Gates. If Bill Gates wasn't allowed to run his charity, and was forced to go around yard sales buying scraps and selling them, he might be making an accounting profit, but he would be earning economic losses. He'd be subjectively better off in charge of the, the Gates Foundation. Yes? It's not just opportunity cost, it's also the subjective benefit of taking that task. Let's focus more on the role of the owner. Karl Marx was famous for talking about uh, laborers being exploited under capitalism. You've heard this word. Workers are exploited under capitalism. Karl Marx was working under something called the labor theory of value. He didn't come up with the labor theory of value myself many years before him by some, uh, some things, lots of people, but it's mostly associated with uh, Adam Smith and David Ricardo, who most people think of as free market economists. And then Karl Marx came along, read Smith and Ricardo, and said, hey, we can use this idea to say laborers are being exploited. When workers are being exploited, he meant that uh, that they're making more money, that their labor is earning more money than they're getting back in wages. He says that's exploitation. Who agrees that that's exploitation? If somebody's making you, if you're the entrepreneur and your worker is making you more money than you're paying them in wages, is that exploitation? Who says yes? Can you justify? I mean, if that's not exploitation, then what is it? Isn't that what a worker's supposed to do, though? Aren't they supposed to be trying to make their company lots of money? And if they're making more money than what they're being paid, that's just their job. It doesn't happen to be happy. Interesting point. That's, that's their job is to pay to do this, yes? The company is taking the risk. We know that there are, the future is not certain. There are unknown unknowns, there are known unknowns, and the entrepreneur is paying the worker first before he's made any money. He's paying the worker first before he's making any money. The worker is getting paid before the entrepreneur has earned any profit. say, hey, why don't we just make a car that doesn't have all the luxuries of a Ford, except it's got a much bigger engine, and it looks nicer, and it drives faster. How much would people pay for such a thing? You have no idea. But you think, I think people will pay 10 times as much as they'll pay for a Ferrari, or sorry, Ford, for this Ferrari. You have some cash but you don't have a Ferrari factory yet. So then you, you hire some X4 people to make you your Ferrari, and then you initially set it up as uh, $100,000, and then you sell out. And then you sell it at 100, or price it at 150,000, you sell out again, and now nowadays, <coughs> some Ferraris sell for a million dollars, new ones. Yeah. population has 40% of the money and then the 90% has less than one quarter. 
Sure. So we'll, we'll, get, we'll talk about uh, exploitation in a second again. But let's just focus on this situation for startups. Ferrari's making a million dollars a car. Now they have all this profit that the guy's making himself. Someone else, Lamborghini, can come along and bid away Ferrari's workers to make their own supercars, or now they're called hypercars. So the workers, the employees at Ferrari, they're being bid away by Lamborghini and Maserati, etc. And this bidding process is what's bidding their wages up. This extra money is coming from the expected profit that the owner thinks he's going to make. Let's go back to the third world countries for an established business. Say Nike in Bangladesh or, or most, uh, a lot of places now in Bangladesh or Vietnam. We talked about sweatshops earlier in the semester. The point there was, early in the semester, was that people working at sweatshops, that was the best option. It was the best option, and when the sweatshops were closed down, what did they revert to? They didn't just get higher wages right away. They had to go into child prostitution, right? Or they died. It was terrible. It was the best outcome of a bad situation. Clothes are made, textiles are made in poor countries today for a variety of reasons, mostly to do with, it's, it's entirely to do with costs, costs are lowest there. But this wasn't the case always. The United States used to be the textile capital of the world. The United States also used to be the agricultural capital of the world. Do you think when the United States was the agricultural capital of the world, wages for agricultural firms were relatively high in the United States, or relatively low? Who says high? One hand. Who says low? Way more hands. The United States had the highest earning farm workers in the world when they were the agricultural capital of the world. They were the agricultural capital of the world because they were so productive. And because they were so productive, they were making a lot of profits. And because there were so many different competitors, they were bidding up the wages for farm workers. Right now, farm workers are leaving the farm to come to the work in the cities. In the old days, in the 1800s, it was the opposite. People were leaving the cities to go and work in the farms. Because farm technology was advancing at such a rate, there was so much money to be made. People were leaving the cities to work on farms. Working on a farm doesn't have to be low pay. Working in textiles doesn't have to be low pay. You gotta look at what are the other structures in place that's preventing profits from going to the laborers. And we know when we close down right now, when we close down a sweatshop somewhere, it's not, people don't just make more money in elsewhere, right? So, um, American Apparel, uh, they went bankrupt a few years ago, they're coming back now. They were famous for making uh, their clothes in LA and they were paying uh, a living wage and they had free massages in their, um, in, their, in their factories, et cetera. And they also sold a t-shirt for $80, right? People were buying it for a while and then the CEO got into some uh, trouble and they had shut down and they bring it back. You can make money, but you gotta set your market properly. The mass product, the mass market for textiles has, is extremely competitive. The profit margins are razor thin. Right now, the way they're competing is by paying third world uh, workers very, very little, but it's still a lot more than what they'd be making in other countries, in, in other lines of work. It's same with, uh, with uh, fruit uh, today. Uh, the United Fruit Company is the world's biggest fruit producer. Their accounting profits per year are about 1%. Those are extremely tiny. For McDonald's, it's about 20%. And then everybody knows the story of people who pick fruits in the United States. 
illegal immigrants coming in across the border, making pennies on the dollar, etc. But it didn't have to be like this. It wasn't always like this. You can think about why uh, in the future. Right now we're out of time, and I'll see you guys on Wednesday. Thank you.